Turn in your Bibles tonight to the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to John. I want to talk to us tonight, continue to talk to us tonight, because it's such a vital subject on prayer. I talked to us this morning. I want to talk to us again tonight. Uh, I'd prepared to talk to us tonight about the Holy Spirit again, but I just, uh, Lord led differently. I'll get back to that. But uh, the theme, of course, uh, uh, for this series of messages, and this will be the sixth one, is good news for troubled times. Good news for troubled times, John chapter number 14, and some very familiar passages of Scripture tonight. But the Bible says, let not your hearts be troubled. Now here is one of the basis for this series. Here's a group of people who are perplexed, they're troubled, they're downcast, they're ready to throw in the towel. Uh, they've got the news from the Savior they've been following for three and a half years that He's going to leave them. They've left all to follow Him, and now they're wondering what in this world is going to happen to us. So Jesus is in the uh, process of encouraging them and strengthening them by saying, don't be troubled. And he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Father, thank you tonight for these moments we have together. Bless us around the Word of God this evening, and I'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Now, with your Bibles open, I want to add two verses to this. I read this this morning, but I want to come back. I didn't hardly get to touch it this morning. Verses 13 and 14. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, for those of you who were here this morning, uh, don't go to sleep on me. Because I, I got to speak to the crowd that wasn't here this morning for just a few minutes. And some of you might have went to sleep this afternoon, and that part of your brain that took it in this morning might have relapsed this evening. But I do want to begin tonight by asking us the same question I asked us this morning. How is your prayer life? How is your prayer life this week? What's your prayer life been like recently? What about answers to prayer? Have you been getting answers to prayer? Can you pinpoint something in your life that is the direct result of your prayer life? Our Lord is getting ready to leave His disciples. He has given them some wonderful good news uh, even though his departure is imminent. Just a few days from this time, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and officially he left them. But he said some things to them that I've been covering in this series of messages. He said, first of all, I'm going to continue to love you. Bible said, having loved his own, he loved them unto the end, chapter 13, verse number 1. He said, secondly, in these passages of Scripture, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And then he said, thirdly, if I go away, I'll come again. Now, those things should have been an encouragement and an inspiration to those around him. He's giving them encouraging words, words of hope. It's not over. He's saying to them, this is just the beginning. But then today, I zeroed in on these two passages of Scripture that I just shared with us this evening. And that is, Jesus said that when I leave, we will still be in communication. Because if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, while he was with them, he supplied their needs. But he's going to leave them. And as he leaves them and goes back to the Father, the good news is, for troubled times, he's still accessible. 
The good news is they can still communicate with him. And he's going back to the throne where he can minister to whatever needs they may have and provide them whatever they may need. And so the wonderful truth this evening is we as Christians have the opportunity to approach a living Savior and bring our request before the throne of grace and enjoy the wonderful privilege of seeing God supply our needs. Now, I'm, I'm really concerned that uh, maybe multitudes of people cannot put their finger on an answer to a prayer. That's troubling because the promise of salvation is real and so is the promise of praying. He has said that he will supply our needs, not our wants, but that he will supply our need. Now, all you have to do is look at the book of Acts and recognize how prayer played an important part in the formative days of the establishment of the early church. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, the Lord has told them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Acts chapter number 1 that those people, the Marys and the disciples, they go to Jerusalem and they meet in a room. And the Bible says they are in a state of prayer. In other words, they're praying in anticipation and waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit of God. Then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. Peter preaches his message. 3,000 people get saved. Miracles begin to take place. The man in chapter 3 who laid at the gate beautiful for 38, 39 years uh, is touched and he's made whole through the power of the resurrected Christ. And then they come along and they imprison these followers of the Lord Jesus Christ because they have worked a miracle in the life of this crippled individual. As a result of that, they are threatened. They are told that they can not preach a resurrected Christ. They're not to proclaim his name. They, as you study the book of Acts, they scourge those, children, those Christians and uh, they imprison those people. And uh, over and over again, we read in the book of Acts that that which strengthened them and brought them through those scourgings and imprisonments and all of those threatenings was as they threatened them, they came together as the early New Testament church and they prayed. The Bible says in the book of Acts, that they prayed and the place was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible says that Peter was cast in prison, but prayer was wont to be made for him. And God heard the prayer, an angel came down, opened up the jail, opened up the gate of the city, and uh, Peter was free to, grow, to go because the church was praying. Paul and Silas in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts are thrown in jail. And the Bible says at the midnight hour, they prayed and they sang songs. Uh, and God looked out over heaven and he said, I really like this. Uh, and he shook the prison, opened up the doors. Uh, and the Bible says uh, that the uh, jailer ran in and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house, Acts 16, 31. Now, all of these events and more took place because the church was praying. It's important in this hour that the church pray. It's important for you individually that you pray. Whatever there is in your life that you're dealing with this evening, you need to bring that before the, the throne of grace. The Bible has admonished us over and over again to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may find grace to help in the time of need. I'm reminded of a little girl who was praying loudly one night and she said almost in a scream. It was near Christmas time. She said, Lord, she said, I want a playhouse and I want a tea set. 
Her mother said, honey, you don't have to scream. God can hear you. She said, I know God can hear me, but grandma can't. <laughs> now, she was praying more for grandma to get her tea set and a dollhouse than she was for God hearing her. But I want you to understand tonight, my friend, according to our text, God is obligated to hear our prayer. Notice what he said. Whosoever or whatsoever you shall ask in my name, he said, I will do that. Now, not only in chapter 14 does he tell us that, but look with me, please, in chapter 16, he repeats himself again. Now, I'm giving you some scripture. I'm going to get going a little different here just in a moment. Hold on a minute. I want you to see this. I want you to see it from what the Lord said, from his perspective, first of all. John chapter number 16, verse number 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Heretofore, uh, have you asked nothing in my name? Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be filled. Now, let me tell you something, folks. Over and over in these passages of Scripture, Jesus is admonishing you, and he's admonishing me to pray in his name and beseech him for the needs in our lives. Now, it's important that we do that. It is vitally important that we take all of the burdens, all of the things that we consider beyond our ability to reconcile of life, bring it before the throne of grace, and let God help us in the time of need. Now, I want you to notice that this, that this prayer, our prayers are to be offered to the Father. Listen to me. Our prayers are to be offered to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying. We get to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. I hear so many prayers, and especially in the political world, I hear people and they'll say a few things to try to sound good to the people around them, and they close their prayer out and they don't even mention God sometimes, and if they do, it's some kind of something that's far off, makes no sense at all. It's a waste of time unless we address the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is explicitly clear in these passages of Scripture, explicitly clear that all prayer is to be offered in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus does not tell us how to get to the Father. The Lord Jesus is the way to the Father. There's a vast difference in what I just said. He doesn't tell us He is the way to get to the Father. Uh, the directions from here to the Father's throne is Jesus Christ. When we invoke the name Jesus, we open up the prayer line right into the very presence of the throne room of God. I got a preacher friend who is a Undertaker. Several years ago, he was delivering a body over in Lynchburg, Virginia. He couldn't find the funeral home. So he stopped at a service station to ask directions to the funeral home. A person was standing in the funeral home and overheard the conversation. The person that over, who overheard the conversation was walking. He said to my preacher friend, I know where that funeral home's at. I'm from this area. And if you don't mind taking me down the road, I'll show you how to get to the funeral home. And my friend was elated. Rather than somebody say, you go down two blocks and turn right, you go down to the square and turn left, go four blocks. There's a statue on the left. You turn, you turn left. And then you go five blocks. And then you find there's a manufacturing plant there and a stoplight. I mean, it goes on forever. 
And so this, uh, this man said, I will show you. I will not only show you, I will take you to the funeral home. So they get in the van and they start down the road. And he said, you turn here, you go here, it's just a short distance, over here to the funeral home. As they're riding down the road, the man who was walking, sitting on the passenger side, is making conversation, showing him the direction. And in his peripheral vision, as he looks over to my friend, the undertaker, he sees a white sheet between the seats. The man who's walking looks over and he beg it begins to connect. Funeral home, white sheet. He says to the undertaker, the, the man who works at the funeral home, he said, what is that? And the man driving, my friend said, that's a body. The man said, stop the van now. Stop the van now. And he immediately stopped. He opened the door. He was on the ground before the van got stopped. Now someone who was going to show him how to get to the funeral home bailed out on him. Let me tell you tonight, no one bails out on you if you want to get to the throne of grace through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are assured and you are guaranteed a hearing in the presence of the, of the Father because the Lord Jesus Christ is the way there. And the reason I know that in John chapter number 14, at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father except he come by me. We have got to acknowledge tonight that there is a way, there is a golden strewn pathway between here and the very presence of God. Somebody asked me one time, would you like to go to heaven? I said, I go there every day. They looked at me weird. They said, what do you mean you go there every day? I said, every time I invoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer, I, that line, that link between here and heaven is made through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are invited into the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ every single time we pray in the name of Jesus throughout the universe, billions of miles, wherever it is, it makes no difference to God immediately when we say, Dear Father, in Jesus' name, my friend, the Father always has time to hear us when we address His Son because the Father loves His Son. The Bible said there's one mediator between God and men, and that's the man Christ Jesus. And here it says, If you ask in my name, if you want your prayer answered, don't forget to put the right address on it. And the address is the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for that. Now, prayer is a wonderful, wonderful thing that God's given us, a wonderful commodity that God has given us. And I want you to turn with me. I'm going to show you a few things about it hurriedly tonight. I want this to help us to know how to pray better and to pray. And I want us to see it in the Bible. Now, I've showed you these scriptures, but I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 John for just a few minutes. The book of 1 John, chapter number 5. I want you to uh, note some assurances that we have. You know, assurance is a wonderful thing. If you can go to the doctor and the doctor, uh, you may think you've got something going on and the doctor says, I can assure you. I'm grateful to have a Christian doctor. Uh, I went to him recently with something, and uh, he diagnosed me, and then he made this statement. He said, I want to assure you that it's not serious. Now, that made me feel good. Whether he was lying or not, I don't know, but it made me feel good. Uh, he said, I give you assurance that everything's going to be all right. When it comes, listen, when it comes to eternal things, we don't need a happenstance. When it comes to eternal things, we need to know some things. We need to have definite, positive assurance that God said it, and if God said it, God meant what he said. 
Now, here are some assurances in this arena that I want you to see tonight from the Word of God. And I've got a lot to say. I've got a short time to say it, so I want to move fast. Now, you're all familiar with 1 John 5.13. In 1 John 5.13, he, he tells us that we can have the assurance of our salvation. Here's the verse of Scripture that came alive to me years ago when I was in a Pilgrim Holiness Church, church I got saved in. And uh, they kept telling me that I could lose what I got. I was reading my Bible one day, and I came across verse number 13. Chapter 5, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. And he makes this statement that you may know. And I said, that sounds pretty concrete to me. That you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now listen, church. Listen closely. That verse of Scripture says you can know you're saved. Don't walk out of here tonight and say, well, I hope I'm saved. You, don't, you want more than I hope so. That verse says you can know you're saved. That's what it says. We know that. But there's also something else you can know. In the next verse, verse number 14, and this is the confidence. Now, notice the word confidence here. The word confidence means assurance. God said in the previous verse, you can be assured, if you come God's way, you can be assured you're saved. But also, you can be assured that if you pray according to his will, he hears you and he can answer and will answer your prayer. Now watch this in verse number 14. And this is the confidence, the assurance that we have. Now there's two words here that I have circled in my Bible. This is the assurance we have, watch the phrase, in him. Now, in order to get your prayers answered, you've got to be in him. The book of Ephesians is a book that over and over says we are in him. We have to be in Christ. So if we're in Christ, we have the assurance that whatever we ask in him, uh, if we ask anything according to his will, the Bible says he heareth us. Now, that's good news. Man, that's wonderful. There's a promise of the Lord. According to his will, we have the assurance, he heareth us. But it goes farther. What's the next verse? And if we know, there's the word know. You see it? I've got it highlighted in my Bible. And we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know Notice, if you will, he keeps saying no. I like that. Not hope so, not maybe so, not could be. Notice what he says. There are some things in this arena of prayer we can know. We know that he hears us. We, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. Notice what he said. Whatever you've asked for, if it's in God's will, if you're praying according to God's will, and when you pray in Jesus' name, you are asking what Jesus Christ would ask if he was in your position. Amen. That's, the, that's the key to it. And a lot of times uh, people say, well, I asked for God for this. I didn't get it. Well, was it according to his will? Was it a selfish mode? James chapter number four said, we ask and we have not and we receive not because we ask that we might consume it upon our own lust. If it's sensual, if it's fleshly, if it's something that God will not get the glory for, if it's something that will not please the Lord, he's going to say no. He'll answer, but he'll say no. But if it's something that will honor him, if it's something that will glorify him, if it's something that he would ask for, if he were here in our body, the Bible said he heareth us, and he giveth us the desires of our heart. Now, that's a promise of God. We ought to be claiming these promises. Now, I want you to, I want you to, I want to give you an illustration of how God operates. Many years ago, Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas, was on the verge of bankruptcy. Now, Dallas Theological Seminary it has been a relatively good school down through the years. There are some things that we would disagree on, but they've had some of the greatest, especially prophetic 
I didn't say pathetic. I said prophetic. <laughs> Scholars to teach in those classrooms. Men like Dwight Pentecost, who has written the greatest book on eschatology, Things to Come. He taught there. He died there. He taught there probably 40, 50 years plus. John Walford, one of the great, great prophetic preachers, he taught there. And it goes on and on and on. But in their formative days, when Dallas Theological Seminary was established, they looked at bankruptcy. The creditors had set a date, and on a particular day at lunchtime, they would foreclose on Dallas Theological Seminary. They brought their board together. The man who was the president at that time, uh, Schaefer, uh, brought a group of people together, and they decided we need to pray. We need to seek the face of God. We believe this movement is of God, and we believe God will provide the needs for this seminary. So they came together, and among their board was an invited guest from Chicago, Illinois. At that time, he was the pastor of the Moody Memorial Church in Chicago, Illinois. And his name was Dr. Harry Ironside. Many of you may have some of Harry Ironside's uh, commentaries. He was a great expositor of the Word of God. And they came together there in the boardroom of Dallas Theological Seminary. When it came time to pray, Harry Ironside prayed this prayer. Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are thine. Please sell some of them and send us the money. Now they thought among themselves, that's a strange prayer. But he meant business. Because he knew there was a God in heaven who in that critical hour could work a miracle. Listen to the story. While Harry Ironside is telling God to sell some of his cattle and send the money in, a Texas rancher has walked into the business office and is talking to the secretary just down the hall from where they are praying. And the Texas rancher says to the secretary, I have just sold two carloads, talking about boxcar. I have sold two carloads of cattle in Fort Worth and said a business deal has just fell through. He said, I felt compelled to bring the check here and give it to Dallas Theological Seminary if you think you might need it. He handed the check to the secretary. The secretary rushed down the hallway, knocked gently on the room door where they are praying, could not get in by the door. She knocked on the door more energetically. Louis Schaefer came to the door. He looked at the secretary. She had a smile on her face with a check in her hand. She handed the check to the president of Dallas Theological Seminary, he looked at it. The check was the exact amount for what the creditors were going to foreclose on. Lewis Schaefer held the check up, looked at Dr. Ironside, who prayed that God would sell his cattle and bring the check into Dallas Theological Seminary. Dr. Schaefer said to Harry Ironside, Harry, God sold his cattle. Amen. Now that's a tremendous story. Amen. It's a true story. But my friend, that's the way God operates. God can supply the need. And I'm very grateful that he can. Now I want you to get to one other verse. I'm going to close with this one. But I want you to see it. Jesus said, I'm going away. I'm going to keep on loving you. I'm going to build you a place. I'm coming for you. 
And in my absence, you can still communicate with me. You can still talk. I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, for just a few minutes, and uh, we'll pull the curtain down. Ephesians chapter number six. Now, I want you to notice verse number 18. This is a verse of Scripture that's meant a lot to me down through the years. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, I want you to note in this verse of Scripture, the word all. The word all sets certain truths in this verse of Scripture apart to the people who will approach the throne of grace in an attitude of prayer. All prayer, all perseverance. I want you to note here the different kinds of prayer in this verse of Scripture. There's a variety of prayer set forth for you and for me. Notice, first of all, he said all prayer and supplication. Now, that simply means all kinds of prayer. Now, here's what it means. As Christians, we have the opportunity to pray publicly. All prayer means that we can pray privately. All prayer means that we not only pray publicly, we can pray uh, privately, All prayer means we can pray silently. Or all prayer means that we can pray verbally. I want you to hear me tonight. This is vitally important. Sometimes we got the idea that we've got to pray to the top of our voice. A group of preachers get together. And I I don't mean to say this sacrilegiously, but It seems like sometimes one wants to see if he can pray louder than the other. And you get in a room and it's almost like, it's almost like people's hollering at God. That bothers me. Because when you're talking to the Lord, uh, for instance, our radio station, I've told our people, the radio station, and and, and of course a lot of the uh, preachers don't do it, we're glad to have them on our station. But a radio station, when a man's preaching, unless people know it's a church setting, that's different. But when people are uh, talking to the listening audience, it's the same thing as if they are sitting in somebody's living room talking to them one-on-one. You wouldn't go in somebody's living room and say, hey, how you getting along? (laughs) You go in the living room and say, how you doing? You talk to them. You communicate with them. I'm afraid too often that we're like the little girl wanting a tea set. We yell. We scream at God. I think sometimes it may get sacrilegious. Are you aware of the fact that God knows your words before you formulate them? Are you aware of the fact that God knows what you're thinking even before you ever pray? That's the reason you can sit in a service like this tonight. And you don't have to be called upon to pray. Listen to me. You don't have to be called upon to pray right where you're sitting. You can say, Lord, help the preacher in your mind. God knows that. You can can move your lips and say, Lord, help the preacher tonight. You can go home and you can pray. Uh, You don't have to. You can. You can verbalize it. You can clothe your thoughts with words. That's fine. But all prayer means all kinds of prayer. Oh, we call upon people here to pray. That's wonderful. But you don't have to be standing up uh, verbalizing something. You can, under, the, under your breath, say, Lord, bless the choir tonight while they're singing. Lord, bless the preacher tonight while he's preaching. Uh, Lord, bless the church tonight. Lord, touch hearts tonight. You can be praying. You say, well, does God hear? Yes, all prayer. And not only all prayer as far as the different kinds of prayer, but all postures. Sometimes people's got the idea, the only way I'd pray is get on my knees. No, no, no. Uh, you, you can pray standing. You can uh, pray kneeling. You can pray sitting. 
You can pray lying down. I pray a lot at night on, and when I lie down in my bed. Uh, you can pray as you drive down the highway. Keep your eyes open. <laughs> but all praying, that's what he's saying. Get a hold of this. Praying always. Get the word. I'm going to deal with this just in a second. Get the word. Praying always. There's the frequency of prayer. When do you pray? Notice what he says. He says pray always. Always. What's that mean? It means be in an attitude of prayer. It means that we ought to be so close to the Lord that the presence of God would be so real in our lives that, that praying would be just as simple to us as breathing. Now listen, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about breathing? Twenty to thirty times under normal conditions a minute, you're breathing. Twenty-four hours a day, 365 days a year, and even leap year, 66, you're breathing. You don't stop and think about it. Do you understand if you was picking up a weight, you had a barbell, and you're working out with a barbell, you know what's going to happen? You're only going to use that barbell so many times. Your arm's going to get to shaking, quivering. I mean, the best person in here who's in the best shape, you keep using that barbell, your arm's going to get weak, it's going to get to shaking, your muscle's going to give out, and you're going to put the thing down. Your lungs, your chest is working 24 hours a day, 20 to 30 times a minute, and it never gets tired. It's a normal reaction. What Paul is saying here is that we ought to be so, so caught up in the presence of the Lord that prayer with us, I'm going somewhere with this, stay with me, that prayer with us is just as easy and just as simple as breathing. Listen to me closely. Do you know that it is, it is harder not to breathe than it is to breathe? Try holding your breath. Now, not now. <laughs> but try holding your breath. You know what happens? You can only hold it so long. It's more difficult not to do what's natural than it is to do that which is natural. Now, what if you came to me tonight and you said, I think tomorrow that I'm just going to, I'm thinking about this breathing. I'm getting tired of thinking about it. And so tomorrow I made up my mind, I'm going to take in one breath tomorrow morning and I'll take in a second breath tomorrow night. We'll have a funeral this week. <laughs> Breathing is normal. What he's saying is we ought to be praying all the time. Prayer for the Christian who is saturated with the presence of God should be something that is constantly on the mind of the Christian like breathing. It ought to be so natural for us to be praying for specific things in our life that it's a constant thing. We take advantage of every hour of every day and we find ourselves going into the presence of the Lord because that's what he said, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Now, what does that mean? It means being God conscious of prayer. God conscious of his presence and so conscious of his presence that we want to be in a constant attitude of prayer. Let me give you an illustration. We wake up of a morning. We ought to condition ourselves. One of the first things we ought to do when we wake up in the morning is say, good morning, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for this day. When we wake up of a morning, we ought to acknowledge the presence of God. As you get ready, you ought to say, Lord, I want to thank you. Now, this may not mean nothing to you, but this is what he's saying. Be, in a, be conscious of God's presence. Lord, I want to thank you for the shower. 
I want to thank you for the soap. Amen. I want to thank you for the washcloth. I want to thank you for the... Lord, I want to thank you for the clothes that's in my closet. And as you put your shirt on or as you put your dress on or you put your shoes on, what he's saying is we ought to be in such an attitude of prayer like breathing. We ought to be so caught up in the presence of the Lord that we're thinking about the goodness of God from the time we get up of the morning until we go to bed at night. Prayer should not be something that's strange. Prayer should not be something that we're not doing. Prayer should be something that we are constantly doing. That's what he's saying. As you go outside and you see the lost neighbor over in the yard, we ought to be so conscious of God's will for our lives that we say, dear Jesus, I love my neighbor. Would you convict him? I want to see my neighbor saved. As you get in your automobile and drive down the highway to the job or to the grocery store, it's a wonderful time to pray and say, Lord, please give me safety as I travel on the road. I mean, that's what he's saying. We ought to be in a constant state of prayer. We ought to pray as we go to the job, Lord, help me to represent you well today. As I go down to where I work to provide for my family, Lord, give me a good day. Help me to be Christ-like in what I say. Help me to be Christ-like in my action. Lord, help me to be Christ-like in my deeds. And while you're driving down the road, you ought to be so conscious of your church. No, not forget it. Remember it. Lord, bless the church today. Bless the church I attend. Lord, bless the members of the church. Lord, bless the pastor of the church. Lord, bless the musicians. I mean, he said, praying always in every situation throughout the day. If we turn Fox News off and NSNBC off uh, and turn CBS off uh, and some of the world and music off and be in a constant attitude of prayer because we're living in the presence of God and we're so heavenly minded, we want to be connected through prayer and ask God for things. Amen. That's what he's saying. He says, pray with perseverance. Verse number 18 Keep on praying with all perseverance. What does that mean? Listen closely. We're going just a minute. And I'm going to say something right here. It'll help you if you listen. Here's what it means. Men, throughout the day, in case you're not doing this, men, throughout the day, you find yourself praying for your wife. Don't, so, don't get so caught up in things that you get out of the presence of God. Live in the presence of God to the extent that you're praying for your wife. You pray for her throughout the day. You ask God to bless your wife. Uh, you ask God to enrich her life. You ask God to bring your wife to spiritual maturity. You tell God, God, I love my wife. Lord, I'm thankful that you have given me my wife. Now today, I'm asking you to bless my wife. How much time do we spend in the day time praying for our wife? Praying always. We're so to live in the presence of God all of the time that we, he said it, we're to be persevering. We are to be constantly in an attitude of prayer because, my friend, every hour of every day, there's something we ought to be praying about. You say, What's he, what are you saying, preacher? Colossians chapter 3. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the Father. That's what I'm saying. Men, you ought to be praying for your wife tomorrow while you're gone. Ladies, yeah, I'm getting to you. You ought to be praying for your husband. Throughout the day, if you don't know where your husband's at, you ought to be praying for him. Lord, I want you to protect my husband. Ladies, you ought to be praying something like this. Lord, give my husband the ability to have spiritual leadership to lead our home. You say, well, my husband. Have you told God about it? Have you prayed for your husband? 
Do you know God's going to hold the man responsible for his house? Not you ladies. I'm not putting you down. I'm telling you the truth. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the home. You know the most miserable wife in the world is the wife that tries to run the home. Now, a wife has a place in the home. But God holds a man responsible. Now, that don't mean, that's another message for another. But that, that don't mean that he's a dictator. That don't mean that he goes in with a whip and snaps it. That's not what it means. But it does mean he ought to be the spiritual head. He, the man, ought to be leading his home spiritually. And the wife ought to be praying for her husband. Lord, help my husband to have the spiritual initiative to lead our home into more godliness. Lord, bless my husband that he'll make the decisions in our home that needs to be made. Lord, keep my husband from the evil one, the devil. Lord, help my husband today on the job to represent me and to represent our children and to represent you well and to represent our church well. Husbands ought to be praying for wives throughout the day and wives ought to be praying for their husbands throughout the day. My friend, there's very little of that that goes on. That's what the Bible says. Praying always. Then parents in closing ought to be praying for their children. Listen, we need to pray that God will build spiritual, spiritual character in the lives of our children. Notice what he says. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watch in there too. Watch this. With all perseverance. That means perseverance means keep on praying. Don't give up. Keep on praying. There's something all of the time you need to pray about. There's somebody you need to pray for. There's needs you need to address. Constantly keep on praying. Pray for your husband. Pray for your wife. Pray for your church. Pray for your job. Pray for the people you work for. Pray for your neighbor. There's something that you can always pray about. But we need to pray for our children. We need to pray that our children, first of all, be saved. Oh, God, deal with them. We need to pray that they will seek early on to do God's will. We need to pray early on that God will put a hedge of protection around them. Listen, folks, it's too late after we fail to pray and the devil catches them in his net. We need to pray early that God will supernaturally put a net around our children and say, God, I don't want the devil to have my kids. Lord, protect my kids from the evil one. Lord, watch over my kids. Lord, don't let the devil destroy my children. They used to do that. And then the last part of verse 18 says we're to pray for all the saints. Pray for all the saints. Now, Jesus said, I'm going away. I want to encourage you. If you pray about some things, and Paul says pray always, God said, I'll hear your prayers. And God says, I'll answer your prayers. And I said this morning, I want to say this last thing. I want to say it again. I'm amazed that we have the privilege of prayer. I'm overwhelmed that a holy God would invite unholy people into his presence. But the God of the universe is on standby. He's on standby to hear our prayers. Always on standby to hear our prayers. I want to ask you, husband, something. Did you pray for your wife last week? I want to ask you, wives, something. Did you pray for your husband last week? My microphone has gone democratic. I want to say that again because the devil didn't want that to get out. <laughs> Men, did you pray for your wives last week? 
Ladies, did you pray for your husband? Did you pray for your church? Did you pray for one another? Praying always with perseverance. You know where we're dropping the ball? You know why there's so many problems that's engulfing those who say they're saved? Is we are not praying. The difference in mediocrity and overcoming victory is the time we are willing to spend in this arena of praying always and praying about everything. And do it in such sincerity that you can see the hands of God take charge and answer prayer. If I could sit in this building tonight and say, I don't think I've ever had an answer to prayer, I'd get around this altar to find out what the problem is. Because just as God saves you, God answers prayer. You ought to be able to look back in your life, pinpoint it. Here's where God intervened. Like the Dallas Theological Seminary. There ought to be an event in your life that right now you can think about, this is what God did. And you know what happens when that happens? It encourages you to keep on praying. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed tonight. If you feel that your prayer life is off center, you ought to come to the altar tonight. Be honest about it. You ought to ask God tonight to help you to get your prayer life back where it ought to be. I've just told you what the Bible says, and that ought to be enough. And if you need to come tonight, would you come as we sing this stanza in just one moment? Father, I want to thank you tonight for helping us. I want to thank you for telling us what we ought to do. Now give us a good sense, Lord, to do it. Lord, many times things go wrong because we don't pray like we should. You said if we'd pray in your name, there'd be an answer. And Lord, help us to pray more often for those we love for those we are especially attached to, that we will lift them up before the throne of grace throughout the day and do that that you would have us to do in Jesus' name. We sing this stanza if others need to come. Would you come?